All right. So, um, in part two, Steve starts talking about uh, violence in Korean cinema. Um, I know you've heard um, me talk about how uh, violence is one of my kind of central areas of study. Um, it's one of these curious things where sociologists talk about media violence quite a bit, but um, uh, actual cinema people and media people don't really talk about it, certainly not in the way that, that Steve talks about it. And it's one of these other things where it's like, um, the explanatory power of, of a book like, like um, Sovereign Violence, I think is something that would help someone understand um, a film like Parasite, you know, and I guess that's the thing, what I'm trying to suggest is in the same way that I don't, I would really like it for people to seek out films that are not the Avengers, I would very much like it if people were, you know, I guess reading Steve's book, I guess this is what I'm trying to get at, is that, you know, for all of the kind of commentary, everyone coming out with their hot take for after Parasite, like, I didn't see anyone asking Steve for an interview, I suppose, is, is one way. Um, you know, I, you know, um, which, which, I guess, like, you know, how I feel about that sort of thing. But, on 13, he talks about how um, violence affects the spectator, right? So, um, this kind of direct jolt, um, which we've talked about in terms of whether it's, you know, alienation or defamiliarization. Uh, and that it produces this sort of moment for critical reflection, and that Korean, violent Korean cinema also provides radical suggestions, right? So another way to put this is that the violence in Korean cinema is not simply a means to an end, where in something like The Avengers or every other film, violence is a, um, uh, the primary solution to conflict resolution. Um, here, it, it's something that, that kind of destabilizes and produces, you know, something else entirely. Like, that it, that it doesn't work the way it's quote-unquote supposed to work. But it's precisely in working in a different way that gives us the opportunity to kind of take stock and consider, you know, um, where we're going and, and, and as such. On 14, he talks about um, the sort of issues that, that, that the violence takes up. Um, Let's see. You know, uh, nationalism, globalization, anti-colonialism, authoritarian politics, democratization. Um, those are all kind of central to the politics of South Korea. Um, and then, uh, on, on also on 14, uh, later, later in the, in the page, uh, uh, like right after that, Steve talks about the, the specificity of compressed modernity which means that in Europe and the U.S., modernization and industrialization occurs after 200 years, and you can only imagine that the shift from feudalism to, to liberalism and democracy and industrialization is something that you know, people have to get used to. In Japan, it happens in 60 years. In Korea, it happens in 30 years. So it's you know, like trying to deal with that in, in an incredibly short, you know, truncated period is going to do a number on you psychically, right? So again, just to kind of reiterate the problem of sovereignty on 15, um, the capacity to decide upon the exception, right? Um, that is sovereignty. And this is where one of the kind of, just to put it again, up again, question, of sovereignty, the capacity to choose the exception, right? Um, this has happened historically again and again. And just to give you an, a recent example, once things were getting really sort of um, heated, or, or escalating with, in terms of the pandemic, hospitals were forced to have this really kind of ugly conversation about if it comes to this, they will have to make 
uh, decisions in terms of caregiving. Uh, Italy had already had to deal with this, which is to say that if the hospital is at um, capacity, they have to start choosing who gets priority, which is to say that other people will have to be kind of left to their own devices, which means that they will have to let them die. That is one of these decisions that kind of has to be made, but at the same time, you know, I guess the point that I would make is there's something really that needs to be thought about in terms of it's not impossible to imagine a completely different social structure or a different organization to the world where we wouldn't have to make those sort of, you know, um, decisions, where everyone would be able to um, get the care that they needed, regardless, that no one would have to be able to have to have be put in a position to make the exception to say that this person gets care, this person does not, right? And we and we have the resources, but we just haven't structured the world in that way, right? We 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 live in a way where we're making these decisions all the time, and so I just want to ask you historically, like who are the people that have been chosen as exception, you know? Um, uh, uh, who are the people that have been disregarded and pushed to the side, marginalized, discriminated against, you know, um, uh, uh, stratified? That's basically what I'm trying to point out. And this goes back to the earlier point about pros and cons. Um, that kind of really ugly dimension to sovereignty cannot be disassociated from, you know, things that we like, like agency and rights you know, um, and individualism and self-determination and independence. All of that has that kind of hierarchy embedded in it. Does that make sense? Um, that's kind of why I've insisted on, and, and that's why Steve is talking about it too, is that, yeah, it benefits us. It also benefits us, like, if I'm the person that, you know, um, um, is chosen over someone else. But that remains the fact that that person still got the short end of the stick, even if it's convenient to me. So, you know, I'm asking us to have the courage to, you know, care about things even when we benefit from them. To not be the type of people that look the other way because, well, you know, things are good for me. Why, why do I care that that person, you know, is, 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 in, is in a rickety boat, right? Um, on 15, to kind of, he, he sort of further really sort of contextualizes this. Um, and he talks about the formations of power that hierarchize and categorically dehumanize human beings in the post-IMF economy. So we have formations of power formations of power. whether it's corporations or, um, uh, I guess, businesses, I'm thinking of, especially in the films. And they exercise their sovereignty to do what? What do they do? They hierarchize who? People. So you have 100 people. They start to order them, right? And they categorically dehumanize them. Which is to say, if you have 100, only 75 of them are people. The 25 are not people, are not humans. We do this all the time, right? And that is the way that by differentiating between the 75 and the 25, and hierarchizing them, this is precisely how we make them the exception, and then exercise power over them, sovereignty over them, right? This is why I'm constantly kind of, and this is really what all of this is about. Something as mundane as saying, we're Colby, Colby Strong and they're Bates, we're better than you, is not separate from something like discrimination. And why is it not separate? This might seem banal and mundane and harmless, but the logic is the same, the mechanisms are the same, the framework is identical. We're still doing the same thing. Just because it's harmless doesn't make it different, right? You're still doing the same thing. 
it, I mean, and if it's so harmless, think about like you know, um, historically in like South America, how people, or even the U.S., like people live and die over sports. That those distinctions between teams become so important that people will kill and die over them, because the mechanism is the same. We are better than you. We are more important than you. This is precisely why I'm so adamant about thinking about value judgments, because I, me personally, I'm just not. I, I just don't. It's precisely because of these reasons that hierarchies are, are um, uh, uh, um, an object of critique. A couple pages later, in 17, more kind of notions of this. How sovereignty means mastery. And mastery not only over myself, you know, I am a strong, independent individual, but it's always comparative, it's always relational. I am sovereign over you, right? Mastery over you. On 18, there's a block quote. We'll go ahead and look at it. Uh, let's see, which one am I thinking about? Sovereign indiv this is about midway through. Sovereign individuals cast judgment and in so doing exhibit a profound lack of empathy for the other. Their aspirations towards self-legislation are simultaneous with acts of violence committed against others and both are inseparable from the reification of the other within capitalist modernity. That is a passage that I would ask you to like look at again and again. That is a passage that I'm going to go home and post on social media. Um, theoretically, he talks about like Walter Benjamin, Giorgio Agamben, and Friedrich Nietzsche. These are kind of the, the, the philosophers and theorists that inform his thinking. You have heard me talk about all three of them, I believe. Um, in talking about melodrama, and especially the ideas of Linda Williams and Christine Gledhill on 19. He talks about humanize, how humanizing fictional characters in melodrama is also a form of sovereignty. Fictional characters are just characters, they're texts, but we have the ability to sort of breathe life in them, right? To imbue them with a, a, a subjectivity that they don't actually have. That's how powerful we are, right? And then finally, on 20 and 21, I just want to talk about um, how Steve is reading this sort of remarkable Korean cinema in relation to a moment in Korean history where during Kim Dae-jung's presidency, the, the government was, was leaning more towards a kind of um, possibility of being together. And that's kind of marked in the monumental North-South Summit where Kim Dae-jung um, and Kim Jong-il met um, uh, in North Korea. Um, so a brief thaw in the politics of the Cold War region, that the possibility of reconciliation and reunification was possible. And so Steve is reading this violent Korean cinema as a moment where violence is actually uh, provides the pr opportunity and, and possibility of, of kind of coming back together. Um, so on page 21, the end of that partial paragraph, all of them express the spirit of self-reflection and risk-taking in the realm of reconciliation that seemed to pervade the spirit of the times, a spirit that is paramount to the ethics I will develop through sover throughout sovereign violence. So the book is talking about not just politics, but ethics, right? What is the ethical way to live in the world? What can cinema teach us and provide us with the opportunity to thinking about how to live ethically? Um, and I want to close both the lecture, the class, the semester with that kind of thought that, you know, us 
us spending this time together, us doing this class, us being in the humanities at a liberal arts college is not about getting a transcript, it's not about getting a better job, it is the humanities because we are learning how, how, how to be human. And, and to put it in a way that this is one of the reasons that I'll always be thankful and loyal to Steve is that it was the spirit that, that I, I sort of glommed onto so strongly because he had put words to something that I had felt for so long and were never really able to articulate, which is this idea that, that in his words, is that we, we need to find a better way to be with one another. And so I, I want to close with that idea. And um, I personally am walking away, despite all that's happened, um, very happy because I think that in some way that, that, that we found our own version of that. Um, and in that sense, I think we can all walk away happy about that, at the very least. Um, okay, so again, but having said that, you know, looking forward to continue talking. I'll be here, um, at least for the foreseeable future, um, and I'll be available. So, you know, um, I'll talk to you guys in a bit.